Hi all, welcome to the first uh, introduction video of AAA subject. In this video, I am going to walk you through and give you a bird's eye view of audit and assurance. This particular video is prim preliminarily taken from your AA syllabus, audit and assurance subject, which is part of your applied skill level. And I am going to uh, summarize it in a very small nutshell because it is very important that you learn certain and specific topics from AA syllabus before you start your AAA subject. Because in AAA, we are going to directly talk about certain jargons which you might not be aware of or you might not remember because you have done AA for quite a long time. So it is very important that you refresh your memory and go through the basic concepts of audit and assurance before you start with the AAA subject. As you know, audit is all about the process. If you have already studied audit, if you have written the applied skill level, then you know that audit is a process and the process remains the same whether you are learning for AA or you are learning for AAA. Only thing is that you will go deeper into the top concepts and deeper into the process in AAA. Furthermore, if you are an exempted route, then for you guys, you might not have studied this with the same seriousness that an ACCA student who have written the exams would have done so. So for you guys, it is very important that you watch this video because it is very important for you to summarize the concepts and understand the technical jargons before you prepare yourself for a higher um, and deeper topic which is AAA. And AAA, they are not going to walk you through the same topics again and again. So they will be just, uh, you know, walking out the facts and taking the concepts directly from AA because you are expected to learn and know those concepts. And hence, I have created this video specifically targeting those students who have either forgotten their AA syllabus altogether. Second, you are an exempted route. And third, you would like to have a base uh, concepts refreshed again so that you can prepare well for your AAA examination. If you don't form part of all these three, then you can straight away go to the next video, which is chapter number one. But if you form part of these three, uh, either of the three, then do watch this video because it's really going to help you refresh a lot of memory and prepare well for your AAA. So first let's understand what are assurance engagements. Assurance engagements are engagements where to obtain sufficient appropriate evidences, um, the practitioner will express a conclusion that is designed to enhance the degree of a confidence. So um, when you read this definition, you might not understand much, but think it in this way. Let us say that uh, for example, let us say that, uh, you know, you have a good food in front of you. Now, you tasted the food and you had the food and you know, okay, it's really good. For you, it's really good. But when you got the bill in front of a restaurant, you got the bill. Let's say you have to pay rupees 1000. For one plate of food, you paid 1000. Is it worth it? Now, how do you know whether the food they served you was actually worth it and is of a prime quality. You need an expert. Let's say that you bring in a food reviewer or a food blogger or let's say for example you bring in a chef himself and he tastes the food and he says that wow this is one of the best food that I've ever tasted and it's of utmost quality and it's of good prime quality. Now as a consumer of the food paying thousand rupees you will be satisfied. Right? So, in a similar way, there are various businesses out there and as an investor, we will be investing in various business. Now, how do we know whether the business is actually functioning properly? How do we know as an investor who is staying outside um, the regular day-to-day -day functioning of the business, how do we know whether the, the management is not doing a malpractice? That's where an expert or a practitioner will come in. He will look at the books of or the or the subject matter, which is the business themselves, look at their financial and they give a conclusion and opinion to us as an investor. And they will say that, you know what, the business looks true and fair. It looks clean. That is an example of an assurance engagement. Similarly, there are various assurance engagements out there. 
It need not be the same example that I told you. There could be others as well. Ultimately, for an assurance engagement, uh, to be called as an assurance engagement, need to have this mnemonics in place that is called as CREST. C-E-R-S-T. Criteria, report, evidence, subject matter, and three-party relationship. So to understand the basics of assurance engagement, let us look at a flowchart. So what is an assurance engagement? Firstly, there involves a subject matter. Like I said, the food on a plate, that is a subject matter. Here, anything that a practitioner or an expert will look into it will be considered as a subject matter. There will be a user or a consumer or an investor. Let's say I am investing in a business. I am the user of the subject matter. The subject matter here will be the business themselves, the financials of the business. Or let's say I want to check whether the uh, business's uh, factory is doing good, the subject matter will be the factory. Likewise, there are various assurance engagement and ultimately there should be a subject matter and there should be a user who will be interested on the subject matter. There will be a responsible party, the person who is managing the subject matter. Right? In the case of the food, I am the consumer who is paying 1000 rupees to buy the food. There will be a chef who would have cooked the food or the restaurant who is the responsible for party who is cooking the food for me. There will be a criteria. So when the expert looks into the subject matter, he will look for a specific criteria to check whether the subject matter is of utmost quality and is fulfilling all the nature he will look into a specific criteria to evaluate the subject matter. And there will be, of course, a practitioner who will be using the criteria to investigate the subject matter. Using the criteria, he will be investigate the subject matter. So hence, in an assurance engagement, you will have three-party relationship. And what are the three parties? Of course, there is a user and it starts with a user. There will be a responsible party who will be taking care of the subject matter. And three, there will be an expert who is a practitioner, an independent practitioner, who will be ensuring that the subject matter is good and he will give a report to the user. So ultimately, the practitioner will give a report to the user. And because the practitioner is, is an expert in nature, Based on his report, the user's confidence will improve. On what? On this subject matter, the user's confidence will improve. So that is called as an assurance engagement. An assurance engagement, as I told you, consists of five elements. The criteria, the, the process by which the subject matter is evaluated or measured to reach an opinion. Let us say there is a food critic who is looking into the food. He will be having certain um, process in his mind which he will be following to evaluate the food. Let us say I am auditing a financial statements. I will have a certain criteria that I will be following to check whether the audit is working. Sorry, to check whether the financial is actually showing a true and fair opinion. There is of course, there is a report. The practitioner will give a report to whom? To the user, the intended user. He will not give a report to the responsible party. Why is that so? Because the responsible party is the person who is preparing the subject matter. So the practitioner should prepare a report and give a report to the user. Only then user's confidence will improve. So a written report is containing the practitioner's opinion is issued to the intended user so that his confidence will improve. And then, of course, if the practitioner has to say that, you know what, the subject matter is of good quality, he needs to have evidence. Anything and everything can be proven only through matter of evidence. And that's, that is basic 101 for our audit. You need to have evidence. You need to gather evidence. Everything what we do revolves around gathering evidence. Your partner is going to say or ask for your evidence. 
If you're saying that, okay, it's true and fair, show me the evidence. If you're saying that it's not true and fair, show me the evidence. Anything that revolves around, uh, you know, the subject matter, we need to prove it. Even if it is good or bad, we need to prove it. For that, we need to collect evidence. And the subject matter is the data that needs to be evaluated and the data is prepared by the responsible party. It can be of many formats. It can be historical financial statement. It can be, you know, internal controls uh, or processes. It can be non-financial information like KPIs. It can be certain compliance related matters, laws and regulations. There are various, as I said, various assurance engagements that we will learn in AAA subject. And finally, it's a three-party relationship. Who all are there? The intended user, the responsible party, and the, finally, the practitioner who is considered as an independent expert on the subject matter and on the criteria to evaluate the subject matter. So let's now look at certain examples of an assurance engagement. What are the examples? These are the examples. The biggest and the most easiest example to remember of an assurance engagement is the statutory audit. What is statutory audit? What in, who all are involved in statutory audit? Let's learn in a minute. But the biggest example is statutory audit. Other types of assurance engagement, we have a se separate chapter altogether to learn about other assurance engagements. But to give you an overview or an example, reviewing the effectiveness of the internal control. The company will have various controls out there. Okay, whether their financial statements are able are, are being prepared without any errors, they will establish a control. Ensuring that there is no fraud done by an employee, there will be a control. Let's say for example, they have inventories. There will be, there will be CCTV cameras. That is a control. For example, unauthorized to prevent unauthorized entry, you will have a what? Um, a, a door and a lock. You will have a watchman. You will have a fingerprint analysis. You have a, uh, you know, um, a face recognition, etc. It's a control. To enter your, to prevent strangers entering your mobile phone or, you know, um, seeing your data in your mobile phone, you have uh, fingerprint locks and password protections for your mobile phone. Again, that's a control. So in the company, there will be various controls and that controls whether it is functioning very well or not can also be part of an assurance engagement where a practitioner will come, check whether the controls are functioning effectively and give an opinion to the user. So that is called as checking the effectiveness of entities internal control. Cash flow forecast. Let us say you want a, you know, a million dollar loan. The bank will ask, what's your cash flow projection? How do you intend to repay us the loan? For that, you need to go to a practitioner and you want him to sign a report stating that the cash flow of the company is good. And when he signs for it, definitely he will ask for evidence. He will check your cash flow details. He will check various informations. He will check your projections. He will check how you're going to get revenues. He will check how you're going to manage your expenses. All of those things he will investigate, the practitioner. Only then he will give you a report stating the cash flow forecast seems to be appropriate. Again, that's an assurance engagement. Review of threats which could affect their business ability to continue as a going concern. So this is more management oriented. It's a management consulting where um, as a management, I want to know what could affect my business tomorrow where my business will not function properly or will I have to close down my business. What are the threats that could affect my business uh, where I'll have to close down my business? Even there will be management consultants who will come in and check what are the threats that you could face because of uh, your nature of the business. Again, that's a assurance engagement. Review of entities' compliance with corporate governance, environmental issues, contracts and other regulations. Compliance related matters. Whether the company is functioning with utmost rules and regulations following all the rules and regulations. Again, that's an example of a assurance engagement. Review of entities financial results for the first half of the year. Statutory audits is where you are reviewing the financial statements for the entire 12 months. If you are reviewing it only for half yearly, 
then that is interim or if you are reviewing it for less than 12 months it is interim so again that is part of an assurance engagement but it's not the same as um, or not equal to a statutory audit it's not equal to a statutory audit so these are the simple examples of an assurance engagement like any work we do even assurance engagement we need to have an approach a professional rather a professional approach so what is the approach that we are going to follow to ensure that the practitioner performs the assurance engagement with utmost quality and gives the best report to the uh, to the users this is the approach they do firstly is to agree the scope of work firstly is to agree the scope of work the client for us so now let's say from we are talking from our own perspective we are the practitioner just imagine that you are the practitioner and you will have a user or a responsible party and that they will be the client now the client you need to agree with the client what is the scope of work you will perform for him because he is hiring you so the responsible party is going to hire the practitioner uh, sorry the intended user is going to hire the practitioner the intended user is going to hire the practitioner so the user will become the client for you now for you you need to agree the scope with the user stating that these are the work that i'm going to do that's the first and primary step you do and of course anything that's not written can be null and void tomorrow anybody can change their words tomorrow so hence whatever the scope you agree with the client put it into a contract and that contract can be called as an engagement letter plan your work plan your work and whenever you plan something look at the risk involved with that work and what is the level of confidence you have to give let's say for a level of assurance let's call it as a confidence what is level of assurance we'll learn in a minute but how confident your user have to be that depends upon the level of assurance you're going to give and you need to plan the work and when you plan the work you need to look at the risk that is involved in your work as well why do you have to look at the risk i'll go back to this first example i told you let us say you are sitting in a restaurant you ordered the food you ate the food and you you paid a thousand rupees uh, bill to the to the restaurant tomorrow and the reason why you went to this restaurant and had this food is because there is a food blogger or a reviewer who said the food is excellent over here he gave a five star reviews etc now you ate the food you went back home your stomach is upset your town sick for 2 3 days now who will you blame will you blame the restaurant first or will you blame the food blogger first if i was in your position i would blame the food blogger or the reviewer first he is the one who first went there and assured us stating that the food is five star quality that's it all isn't it so that is a risk of doing this kind of practice if you are a food blogger or if you are a practitioner who is an ex- calling yourself expert in this field you have a risk associated to it why because based on your judgment based on your conclusion many people will follow your herd they will be interested to go to the restaurant and because you said so they will be going to the restaurant and because of that what will happen your opinion could be damaged your conclusion could be damaged the food blogger's conclusion could be damaged and hence a user would blame the practitioner first for giving an inappropriate opinion and hence we need to look at what is the risk involved so the food blogger in the first place he should have been very careful he should have looked at have there been any instances where someone have had food from this place and had a bad stomach in future that's the first thing that the food blogger should have done that is what is called as a risk because he is giving a five star review now many people will be watching him following his footsteps going and eating paying 1000 rupees eating the food next two days they are down sick 
Now, the first image that is getting destroyed is not even the restaurants. It's actually the food bloggers, which who is called as the so-called practitioner. So similarly, in an assurance engagement, the practitioner is giving a report or an opinion to the user and the user will blame first the practitioner because the practitioner is the expert. Now, he will not blame, he will blame, of course, the responsible party, but the user by nature will not believe the responsible party. That's why he hired a practitioner to give an opinion on the subject matter which is prepared by the responsible party. So, because of this, the user will definitely blame the practitioner and that's what the risk associated for the practitioner. The risk where his opinion might be wrong. That's what we need to search for as a practitioner. And of course, depending upon the risk, depending upon how confident the, how confidence the user wants to get, we will, we will give two kinds of assurance. That is called as the level of assurance. And once you plan, you obtain sufficient appropriate evidence. Why? Because if you want to arrive at a conclusion, you need to obtain the evidence. If the food blogger have to give 5 star rating first, he has to taste the food. He himself have to taste the food, wait for 2 days for, to check whether his tummy is okay. Only then he can give an opinion. Once all the evidence have been gathered, you perform an overall review and then form an opinion. Issue assurance report to the client as per the pre-agreed format. So it's a six-step process where everything is laid down very perfectly. You agree the scope of work with the user, formalize the agreement with the user, plan the work and look at the risk for the practitioner and the level of assurance that the user needs, obtain the evidence to arrive at a conclusion, perform overall review check overall whether everything is fine and give an opinion and write it your opinion in a report format and give it to the user that's the approach to the assurance engagement the best part of learning this subject is that this is the entire process flow this process flow is the same across any assurance engagement you do all you need to do is agree the scope of work get into a contract look at the risk Check the assurance, obtain evidence, perform an overall opinion, uh, overall review and form an opinion, give it as a report. Give it as a report. So remember, as a practitioner, what you're going to face is definitely a bigger sort of a risk. So before you start any work, plan for the work, look at the risk because in AA as well as in AAA, all our approach is a risk-based approach. So, um, the assurance engagements are divided into two kind types of or levels of assurance. One is uh, limited assurance and another is a reasonable assurance. So, we said that um, audit is part of an assurance engagement, right? The statutory audit is part of an assurance engagement. So, in terms of an assurance engagement, um, we are giving an opinion on the subject matter. The practitioner is giving an opinion on the subject matter to the user, which is prepared by the responsible party. So the assurance, the user's confidence will improve based on the practitioner giving an opinion on the subject matter. Because definitely, if you think about it, for the um, user, if there is an expert who is coming into and checking the subject matter and giving an opinion, he will be more comfortable stating that yes, um, it makes sense and we are okay with the financial of the business, etc. So, uh, in any kind of assurance engagement, there are two levels of assurance. One is reasonable assurance and second is limited assurance. In any kind of assurance engagement, we can never give absolute assurance. A practitioner will never say that everything is perfect with respect to the subject matter. He can never ever say this. So we can never give an absolute assurance. Only either a reasonable assurance or a limited assurance can be given. Reasonable assurance are positive in nature. It's equal to saying as good. Limited assurance is saying that, okay, you know what? It's not bad. 
if you say oh it's not bad there could be good for some people but it can be bad for some people as well that is called as negative assurance we are not saying it's good but we are we are not saying that it's bad as bad either we are just saying it's uh, you know it's not bad that's it you cannot say that it's bad but we cannot neither say that oh you know what everything is good in that positive uh, assurance or a reasonable assurance is equal to saying oh you know what it's good we have collected the evidence and it's good but absolute assurance is where we are saying it's perfect it's never perfect for a practitioner specifically in financial statements it's never ever perfect the moment you say perfect then you are giving absolute respond you are taking absolute responsibility for the subject matter and when you do that as i told you there will be huge repercussions and there will be huge risk involved so hence in terms of an audit we give reasonable assurance because it's a high level assurance for any other assurance engagement we try to give a limited assurance internal control review it might be a limited assurance interim audit review limited assurance but reasonable assurance are given where there is a higher level or a higher degree of assurance that is required by the user an example is statutory audit so to give you the absolute difference between the reasonable assurance and the limited assurance the assurance report for reasonable is positive limited is negative example is a statutory audit example is a review of cash flow forecast but in both cases in both cases you need evidence even if you want to give reasonable assurance even if you want to give limited assurance you need to gather evidence how much evidence you will gather on what all areas you will gather what are the techniques you will use to gather the evidence what will be the process you will follow to gather the evidence might differ in reasonable assurance we will use everything every guns we will go all the guns blazing to obtain the evidence but in limited assurance we will uh, we will follow only limited processes less work because we are giving only less opinion we are not saying it's good we are just saying it's not bad so to uh, to check whether it's not bad to say whether it's not bad you know you can you don't need to do much of work you can do less work so and when you say less work you will gather less evidence so the evidence on limited assurance will be lower but for reasonable assurance if you want to say it's good then definitely you will obtain more and more evidence and the more evidence you gather the more work you will have so reasonable evidence assurance is more work limited assurance is less degree of work and of course the higher degree of uh, assurance you give higher risk you have the more assurance you give will be equal to more risky why because people are following your footsteps so when you give a reasonable assurance then definitely there is high risk involved so you need to be a little careful before you give an assurance so students let's um, understand the responsibility matrix that revolves around audit okay like what all cons who all consists of an audit like how the mnemonics crest we learned the criteria uh, responsible party evidence sorry criteria report evidence subject matter three party relationship and the the flow chart that we learned for assurance engagement how does it work for an auditor now as you know everything starts with the company everything uh, that revolves around uh, this audit starts with the company now the company are does not flourish on its own right so there is someone called as the shareholders who invest in the company owns the business invest the company and make it and put together as a business model and then the shareholders invest start put their funds into the company and then they will appoint management they appoint the management like the ceo the cfos uh, managers sales director this director uh, finance director all those directors they will appoint who will run the company they will manage the company now one part of the management consists of the finance team the finance team 
uh, and in finance team there will be CFO, the chief financial officer, finance director, etc. What they will do? They will prepare the financial statements. They are the ones who are going to prepare the financial statements for the company. Now, why do they have to prepare the financial statements? So that the shareholders who have invested their money, who have invested their money into the company, they can measure the performance of the company via the financial statements prepared by this management. So the shareholder will get the confidence that whether the company is actually making profits or are they making losses or are we you know losing the investment what is happening they will be able to measure the performance of the company via the financial statement that is prepared by the management but think about this when the shareholders invest in the company they will appoint the management but definitely the shareholders will believe the management but do the shareholders trust them now believe and trust are two different words believe is something that oh, you know what i believe you but trust is something which is of higher category believe means that oh you know what uh, if he says something uh, you know what i had a um, i had a good biryani today and believe me it was good means uh, yeah i believe you it should have been good trust comes high degree now for the same person if he says that i will cook for you and you eat it will you trust him no not at all if the same person takes you to the restaurant and says that believe me that it is a good restaurant you might go but the same person he says you know what you come to my home i will cook lunch for you will you trust him now that's a trust trust is where you give his your life to him right and saying that boss take it up you do whatever with it with it trust comes with high degree so shareholders when they appoint the management they do believe them they can never trust in a deeper way why because they will always be skeptical thinking that the management might do something wrong yaar because they are getting paid every month what if uh, they made some mistakes and they forgot and they hide the mistake and then they will appoint someone independent in nature then they will appoint someone independent in nature that is called as the auditor and the auditor who claims himself to be the expert he is the expert he will read the financial statements and what he will do he will simply um he will simply give his opinion he will simply give his opinion or a report a report to the shareholder as simple as that so he will read the financial statements he will look at the financial statement that is prepared by the management and he will give a report to the shareholders that report that is issued by the auditor will improve the credibility what is the meaning of credibility which means trustworthiness if let's say that oh you know what the financial statement looks good and it's said by the auditor the shareholder will start trusting the management will start trusting the management that is the responsibility matrix this is the entire overview of the responsibility matrix for an auditor so what is the objective of an audit engagement as per isa 200 as per isa 200 overall objectives of an auditor Uh, and the conduct of an audit in accordance with the international standards of auditing the definition of what audit states is the following so this is directly coming from the standard called as isa 200 audit is to obtain a reasonable assurance so we know that now it's a audit we are going to obtain a reasonable assurance about whether the financial statement are whole as a whole are free from material misstatement whether due to fraud or error thereby enabling the auditor to express an opinion on whether the financial statements are prepared in all material aspects in accordance with applicable reporting framework and to report on the financial statement and communicate as required by isa in accordance with the auditor's findings so in a nutshell the objective of the auditor is to 
review the financial statements and check whether the financial statement are free from material misstatement or not and material misstatement could be due to fraud or it could be due to error he will gather the evidence to obtain his conclusion which is his opinion and based on his opinion if the entire financial statement is free from material misstatements then he will um, he will give a true and fair opinion to the to the uh, to the user right but if it is not true and fair which means it contains financial statement contains material misstatements in that case he might uh, give a non true and fair opinion to the user so ultimately the primary objective of an auditor is to express an opinion whether it is true and fair whether it is non true and fair so for that he will collect evidence to check whether the financial statement are free from material misstatement or not so ultimately you need to understand that the primary most objective of an auditor is to express an opinion to whom to the user and who is the user the shareholder and what is the subject matter the financial statement and on what criteria are we following we are following a criteria that is called as isa the international standards of audit using the international standards of audit the framework as well as the various process that's involved we identify the findings and communicate to the shareholders so in a very small nutshell the objective of an auditor is to conduct uh, or review the financial statements as per isa and give an opinion to the uh, to the um to express an opinion to the user that's it that's what the um objective of the uh, auditor is now when the auditor expresses an opinion if the financial statement are free from material misstatement it means that they are true and fair but what does true and fair means true means what true means it conforms it's factual and conforms with reality the information conforms with the required standards and law the financial statement have been correctly extracted from the books and records that is what true means in another words or in a simpler words true means it has actually occurred we are not lying it has occurred we have evidence to say that it has occurred if we pay for an expenses we have the invoice to say that okay you know what it has occurred that is what is called as true we are not showing something which doesn't uh, incur at all that is called as true what about fair fair means unbiasedness when do you become unbiased when you are not following the rules when the rules are being mended is where you are becoming biased so fair means information is free from discrimination and bias and in compliance with the expected expected standards or rules the financial statement reflects the commercial substance and all the underlying transactions it does not have any kind of discrimination or any kind of biasness and it complies with all the expected standards as well as rules and regulation is called as fairness to give you a simple example a very simple example which you would have studied in your sbr or which you would have studied in your fr or in even in financial accounting it's a simple example is for a non current asset let's take an example the non current asset standard says that if you incur an expense you can capitalize it right so when you capitalize as an asset whatever cost you incur you can capitalize it as per certain criteria now as per ia 16 if you are buying an asset whatever the professional fee the purchase price you pay for it you can capitalize um any professional fees you pay for it you can capitalize um any documentation fees you can capitalize all of those things you can capitalize even when you are testing it you can capitalize but ia 16 very clearly says that any kind of training fees what does training fees mean which means any fees 
or any expenses you pay to the employer sorry the employees to train them to get used to the asset that cannot be capitalized so that a standard very clearly says that training fees cannot be capitalized this is very clearly mentioned in all the standard now that's a rule now if a company capitalizes the training fees then they are unbiased it's not fair as per the standard it's not correct so they have paid for the training fees they have incurred the training fees it's true you can see all the evidences that see i have paid to my employees they have signed for it they have given us the contract yes all of this is true but it's not fair you cannot capitalize it because the standard does not allow you to capitalize very simple so hence fairness means fairness means you should not show any discrimination to the rule and regulation you cannot say that you know what this particular expense i am going to bend the rules and capitalize it it's not allowed only if a transaction conforms to the reality which means we have evidence to prove the transaction that it has occurred and it has occurred as per the relevant accounting standards we can say that the transaction is true and fair the transaction is true and fair and this is what an auditor tries to achieve trust me this is what he is trying to achieve he is trying to gather all the necessary evidences to prove the transaction that it is true and fair when he fails to do so that's when his opinion changes from an unmodified opinion he might give a modified opinion modified opinion means it's not true and fair we will learn that in detail but how does he achieve or how does he conclude it how does he come to this opinion let us learn that through a process overview flow chart so this entire page summarizes the entire process of an audit like top to bottom this is what auditor does uh, to complete each and every audit engagement the first step is to accept the client accept the audit engagement so every auditor uh, before he starts uh, accepting or starts the audit process he first performs certain preliminary screening of the client known as kyc um, preconditions of the audit uh, you know etc why because as i told you there is risk involved for the auditor the auditor is an expert and when he is giving an opinion his opinion can become inappropriate or his opinion can be read by someone and uh, he will be looking into that opinion and doing an investment and if that's the case then if there are many people who are looking into his opinion then something goes wrong if there is some issue which is not even his fault will end up um, you know blaming everybody blaming the auditor and hence even before accepting the client auditor have to ensure that uh, the client itself is good and there is less risk involved or the risk is moderate or even if there is high risk he knows the risk and he navigates through the risk very pro clearly and properly so it's very important that the first and primary most step uh, is to accept the audit engagement and even before accepting the audit engagement the client uh, the auditor will perform certain kyc know your customer or know your client processes he will look at the preconditions of the audit to check whether certain conditions are being met and whether the client knows what are their responsibility whether the auditor knows what are their responsibility whether the uh, look at the required you know standard that's uh, involved in preparing the financial statements etc all of those is understood and by the both parties etc even independence if the if the auditor is independent and does not have any relationship with the client is also taken a consideration before an audit is uh, an engagement is accepted so independence comes before the uh, acceptance of the engagement we will study about independence ethics etc in the next chapter in chapter 2 but uh, just understand this for the time being once he does uh, once he does that second is to understand the entity and its environment before once he has accepted the client he has entered into a contract he will understand the entity in detail like what what do they do in detail what are their day to day practices looks like who are their uh, management who are their directors what are their uh, day daily financial transactions what are their internal controls which erp system they follow all of those things the third one is to look at the risk 
the risk of material misstatement. As I told you, the objective of the auditor is to find out evidences to give a true and fair opinion. That's his objective. Like he's trying to find out evidences to say that financial statement are true and fair, which means it's free from material misstatement. But his, his opinion could go wrong. His opinion could go wrong because there would be mistakes and he might not identify the mistake. And if he's not identifying the mistake, that is a risk for him. Again, why? Because if he is giving a wrong opinion, as I told you, there will be many people who will be depending upon his opinion. And if he is giving a wrong opinion, and there are people who are depending upon his opinion, the people who are depending on the opinion will blame the auditor. And that is a risk. So, this is where our risk-based audit we are trying to identify. We are trying to identify potential misstatement that could occur in any engagement. That's the primary step that we try to identify. This identification of risk of material misstatement is what your section A 50 marker question is all about. And that's what we're going to learn in detail. We will identify the risk associated to the material misstatement. What are the risks? To give you a simple example, Auditor are supposed, oh, sorry, the, uh, the company is supposed to account for a transaction in a so-and-so standard. Let's say, for example, he is supposed to account for a transaction as per IIS 16, but he didn't account properly. And there is a mistake. As an auditor, we did not identify the mistake. We cleared a clean opinion. That is a risk. When we get the audit, uh, when we get the audit work itself, when we get the financial statement itself, the person who prepared the financial statement does not even understand IFRS. There is a risk. There will be thousands of mistakes. The auditor now has to identify and ask the client to rectify. It's a risk. The controls which is supposed to identify mistakes in the financial statement are not working properly. So risk. So like that, there are various risks which we will learn in a shortly in a summarized way, but the risk is what we are behind. The auditor is behind the risk. Once he identifies the risk and proves that there is no misstatement, his objective is complete. And one of the way he tries to prove the mistake is through checking the controls because the primary objective of the control is to ensure that there are no risk of material misstatement. The control are divided into two parts. Um, in, when we do the control testing, it is divided into two parts. First question that we ask is whether there are control in the finance, in the company or not. To give you an example, if it is a small company, they might not have enough controls. They might not have checkings. Like there will be only one accountant. There will be no senior. So the one accountant, whatever he is preparing, it cannot be checked by the senior. Because they cannot appoint, they cannot afford to appoint a senior. So in small companies, they don't have enough money to, in uh, you know, incorporate controls. So definitely it will be a no. But in certain medium size or big size companies, they will incorporate controls. They will have systems in place. They will have uh, security cameras in place. They will have various other systems in place or process in place to ensure that mistakes does not occur due to fraud as well as due to error. If there are controls in place, then the auditor will test them. If there are controls in place, we will test them. Yes, there are controls, then we have to test it. If the controls, we have tested it and we found it satisfactory, we perform something called as RSP, the reduced substantive procedures. Reduced substantive procedures means, reduced means what less. Substantive procedures means, Process of collecting an evidence. Substantive procedures means process of collecting an evidence. If the controls are good, which means the controls major objective is to ensure that the errors are prevented or detected. So if the controls are functioning effectively, we just have to do less work. Auditor have to do less work to obtain the evidences. 
But if the controls are not functioning well, which means there are more, there could be chances of more errors. So first step we will do is if the controls are not effective, we communicate the deficiencies. To whom? To the management. We communicate the deficiencies to the management. We tell them that what you are doing, it's not correct. There are no controls. The process is not correct. This is not how you have to carry on, etc. The controls are there, but the test of controls came unsatisfactory. Then also we will communicate the deficiencies. And in and either of the case, we will do something called as full substantive procedures. For the time being, full substantive procedure means more work. We will collect more evidence to prove a transaction. Reduce substantive procedures with less number of steps or less number of evidences, we can prove a transaction. And finally, once you have collected the evidences, you have collected the, uh, you know, um, transactions and you have reviewed the transaction, you will go for a final review. You will check overall the financial statement, whether it looks good. And based on that, you will send a report to the management and you will prepare your auditor's report, including of the auditor's opinion. Including the auditor's opinion. And this opinion will be a reasonable assurance, as I told you, not 100%. So when it is not 100%, if there are all transactions, if there are 100 transactions, when we give reasonable assurance, do we test all the transactions? Never ever. We test based on samples. Auditor always tests based on the samples. So, when it comes to reduce the substantive procedures for certain type of transactions, which uh, might not be necessary to test it, which we will learn in deeper, but which might not be necessary to test it. To give you an example, if there is a company, the company is, you know, making revenue, they have cost of sales, purchases, etc. There is a small petty cash expense. We might not test it. Some small petty expenses. We might not test it in reduce substantive procedures but in full substantive procedures we cannot do that we have to test everything it's like 100 percent testing like 100 percent because we don't trust them so we have to go deeper we have to take more samples we have to gather more evidences we might ask for one or more evidences for same transactions to confirm the truth and fairness of the transaction so more work there will be more work involved so if you're collecting Let's say if there is 100 transactions, if you're testing only 75, it could be a reduced procedure. So that's less work, right? You just have to check 75 transactions and check against their evidences for the 75 transactions. But, but definitely, if you have more than 75 transactions, you're going to test all the 100 transactions, then you're going to do a full substantive procedure. You're going to test all of them. That's more work. That's the difference between reduced and full substantive procedures. So this is the entire overview. It's very important that you very clearly, even before you go to the next level, you understand this overview. In fact, uh, right now itself, pause the video and take a note of this overview. Write it down, uh, keep it in your memory, keep reading it because uh, even when you are writing, to give an example, there could be cases where in your scenario, the controls are not working fine. They could say that the controls are ineffective. So as an auditor, you are, ex uh, you are expected to step into the role of an auditor. You will have to mention in your answer, go for full substantive procedure. Okay, the controls are not effective, go for full substantive procedure. So this is very important that you guys, as a student, of AAA understand this process because this is the basic 101. In with this process is where your audit at AAA, your advanced audit and assurance is gonna start. Your advanced audit and assurance is gonna start. Because also another part is that risk of material misstatement is a deeper question. There are various risks out there and we might have to identify the risk and write it in a deeper way. 
So it's very important that you understand certain specific topics before you go and write the attempt for the 50 marker. Two things that's very important for an auditor throughout his audit journey for any client or anywhere that he's performing his, uh, his um, services is to have professional skepticism and professional judgment. These two words or these two jargons are very important for you as a student as well. You need to clearly understand what these words mean and quite certainly apply them during the course of your exam. Professional skepticism and professional judgment are two primary words that you need to always remember throughout the course of the audit and throughout the AAA examination. What is professional skepticism? A simple uh, answer for professional skepticism is to have a questioning mind. Now the questioning mind doesn't mean that you contradict everything. It's all about being alert to the conditions which might indicate a possible misstatement due to error or fraud and a critical assessment of the evidences. You as an auditor should always be having an alertness whenever you are looking into an evidence. Does this evidence look good? Uh, does this evidence contradict with, with any other evidence that is given to us? Um, from where did we, what is the source of this evidence? From where did we get this evidence? Um, does the source is from a bad source or a good source, etc. Does, is the client saying the truth when he is talking to us? Um, is he hiding something? Um, question the client when it comes to the transaction rather than, you know, believing him altogether. If he's saying a transaction, this is what is happens. Then understand about the process. Like, what is the process? Please explain to us the process. How did you record it? Why did you record it in this way? On what basis you recorded it? What is the source of this transaction, etc. Asking those questions, which will help you to identify whether first case, whether the client is lying or not. Second case, is there any fraudulent activity? Third case, in fact, are there any errors? So always thinking those questions in your mind will help you to navigate through the evidences and navigate through the transactions and you will try to identify error or fraud in a in a in an evidence or even in a transaction that's why you need to have professional skepticism whereas professional judgment involves having application of the relevant training knowledge and experience and taking an informed decision you have studying ACCA now once you have completed ACCA you have got the relevant technical skills you have got the knowledge now through this knowledge with this knowledge and the technical skills you need to perform the audit process and take informed decisions during the course of the audit now how do you take a decision your decision will come based on checking all the evidences checking all the information given to you questioning yourself on the information and ensure that you have done everything properly then you say yes this is a true and fair so judgment involves taking a decision judgment involves taking a decision take a case like the word judgment itself take a court case there is a prosecutor um, lawyer there's a prosecutor lawyer and there is a defendant lawyer they both you know argue in the court of law and the judge by hearing both of their argument looking into the evidences ultimately check uh, says whether the defendant or even the criminal uh, is the is he is he guilty or not guilty is a penalized one he is a guilty or not guilty is he arrested one he is a guilty or not guilty so that's what is called as decision making means you look at all the information that surrounds based on your experience based on your knowledge based on your training everything you take a decision yes this is what uh, is what happening that is called as professional judgment that is called as a professional judgment and as an auditor you require professional judgment and you are required to uh, perform professional judgment or impart professional judgment through various processes when you are determining materiality when you are identifying audit risk what are the various risk in the audit when you are determining what is the material materiality threshold above which you can say that any error is materially misstated below which is not materially misstated 
what how much procedure you have to do when you have to do this procedure to what extent you have to do this procedure evaluating whether you have got got all the evidence you look at the evidence and check whether you have got all the evidence or not drawing conclusions based on the evidences yes we have obtained all the evidence now i can say that the opinion uh, i can clearly mention the opinion evaluating whether the manager have management have applied the apl applicable framework all of this checking it and concluding that yes and going ahead and saying yes everything is appropriate is a judgment decision and not just the auditor even the management performs a lot of judgment when they are saying that their uh, depreciation uh, useful life is x amount x years that is a judgment they cannot clearly say that a building will uh, sustain for 50 years or 60 years and they say yeah 50 years is what we are going to depreciate for is based on their experience based on their information they have gathered they are saying that it's for 50 years provision when they uh, you know um, account for provision is a judgment they try to come up with a appropriate figure to say what is the provision amount that's a judgment the management is taking a judgment so when management takes a judgment we also have to take a judgment and through during the course of audit we um, in fact we inculcate quite a lot of judgmental areas where we have to scale through gather evidence gather information apply our professional skepticism get all the information and take a decision and when auditor takes a decision that is called as judgment so as i told you every audit uh, now is all completely based on risk based audit what is risk based audit means which means the auditor even before he starts performing its actual work or even before he tests whether the controls are working fine or not the first step is what he is going to do is to identify the risk the risk that is involved with the audit now audit risk are divided into three categories so ar means audit risk audit risk a risk in an audit are divided into three categories inherent risk um inherent risk control risk and detection risk so inherent risk control risk and detection risk now what is inherent risk inherent risk is the risk that is associated with the company themselves so in risk that is inherent to the business or the audit that we are getting from the company is an inherent risk to give you an example if the company is following a specific standard that is an inherent risk why because they might not be uh, you know accounting the standard properly it's an inherent risk if the company is like a banking company the banking company are high risk companies if the company is a public limited company it's in the company is a high risk client for us why because it's an inherent risk the nature of the company the way they conduct the business the way they are accounting certain transactions uh the way they are not accounting certain transactions all of this form part of the inherent risk so anything that is inherent to the company's nature the way they do business their accounting standards uh the, the treatment of the transactions all are part of the inherent risk mm, the even before we consider uh you know the controls the way the transactions are being treated by the company could be resulting in a misstatement are called as inherent risk now the control risk is where the controls of the transactions are not or the controls established by the company are not appropriate due to which uh, there could be errors in the financial statement that is called as control risk um to give you an example let us say you know there is nobody someone is uh, you know paying salaries to their employees but no one is checking how much they have been paid um, the pay slips are not authorized new employees are coming into the system and nobody is checking that that's a control failure because the person who's paying the salary can easily do a commit a fraud this is a simplest example that is called as control risk so these two the inherent risk and the control risk are called as risk of material misstatement they are called as risk of material misstatement and they are majorly with the client like it's it's uh, it's because the client are not Uh, it's either because the client are in a such a business that they are risky in nature or because the client is not establish the controls effectively due to which there could be risks are called as risk of material misstatement 
Whereas detection risk is completely with the auditor. Like the auditor fails to detect, uh, fails to detect the risk that is involved in an audit. Like the client, uh, you know, uh, knowingly or or unknowingly made a mistake, but the auditor, he himself did not identify it. So the detection risk are divided into two aspects. One is sampling risk. The second is non-sampling risk. Sampling risk is where he is choosing an incorrect sample. Um, let's say we chose one sample. Let's say the 25th item. There are 50 transactions. We chose 25, item number 25 to test it. But we didn't choose item 26. But the mistake was not there in item 25. But the mistake was there in item 26. So we chose the sample incorrectly. That is called a sampling risk. Any other risk other than sampling risk or non-sampling risk where the auditor failed to identify a mistake like it was right in front of him he chose the sampling risk sorry he chose the sample correctly there was a mistake in that sample but still he did not do it properly um, or he did not does not understand or he did not understand the process properly or transaction properly and because of which uh, you know he made a mistake or he failed to uh, you know identify the mistake that is called as non-sampling risk the primary most important step that an auditor needs to perform is to assess the risk and establish an appropriate response for the risk. If you have identified the risk, how you are going to approach it? How? What are the procedures you are going to perform? What are the areas you need to focus on? How you will uh, mitigate the risk and ensure you give an appropriate opinion is what we are going to do as an auditor. That's what is called as risk based audit. We identify the risk and clearly document the response we are going to approach or the approach we are going to perform and only then we perform the next steps of control testing and substantive procedure is called as a risk based approach. So focus is primarily on the risk and that's why we have 50 marker which focuses on identification of audit risk. In fact, in AAA, you have business risk as well. But in AA, you don't need to learn business risk. But in AAA, you do have to learn business risk and identification of business risk as well. In certain um, quest scenarios, you will be asked to write the appropriate response as well in your Section A question. So risk-based audit is very important and this is a very important part of your syllabus. Once you identify the risk, uh, you know, even before that, all the audit is, uh, the audit that you perform is always based on something that is called as materiality. Materiality. It's very important. As I told you, the auditor is not going to give an absolute assurance. He's going to give a reasonable assurance. Now, the reasonable assurance, he's saying that the financial statement are free from material misstatement. What is misstatement? Errors. Or... Uh, which are done by the company, which are, uh, uh, you know, incurred by the company. It could be errors, could be uh, deliberate in nature, which leads to fraud or non deliberate in nature, which leads to a genuine mistake. Misstatement is simply where what it's supposed to be accounted and how it is actually accounted. The difference between the two is your misstatement. The standard says you have to account it in this way. That's how it has to be accounted. And if the client does not do that, it's a mistake. Now, to identify the material, uh, to identify the misstatement, auditor establishes a threshold. He will establish a threshold. Now, why he establishes a threshold? How by establishing a threshold, he will be able to identify a mistake? Just uh, for example, let us say, uh, let us say dollar thousand. Let us say, for example, there is a thousand dollar missing. Okay, so let's say, for example, the thousand dollar is missing. Thousand dollar missing. Now, the thousand dollar is missing. When you hear the term, it could be related. For some people, thousand dollar might be like, oh, it's not that big. For people who are a millionaire, will be like, $1,000, I don't even care about it, man. Let it go. 
for people who are earning only two thousand dollar, it will be like fifty percent of his income. Thousand dollars missing, my God. For people who are earning less than thousand dollars, he'll be like a massive big amount. For people who are earning ten thousand dollars, it's like ten percentage. For people who are earning, let's say, uh, you know, hundred thousand dollars, it's one percentage. So depending upon that, depending upon whoever is earning this, uh, how much ever they are earning, the the amount can vary. The amount can vary. So, as an auditor, the first way to identify a mistake is to establish a certain threshold. If we say, okay, we will establish a threshold, we will be more scrutinized. Our mind will go in such a way that we will scrutinize any transaction which is above the threshold. Now, let us say the same thousand dollar. I'm gonna give it to you. I'm saying, okay, there is a thousand dollar. And I'm telling you, look at this list of transactions. Any transaction that is above thousand dollar, you put it in one basket. Any transaction that is less than thousand dollar, you put it in another basket. Will it be easier for you to categorize a transaction? Of course, yes. So an auditor is not going to test everything. So the primary most step he has to do is to establish a threshold because he is not giving an absolute assurance where he goes and checks all the transactions. But if he wants to check uh, uh, the transactions and he wants to give a reasonable opinion, he needs to arrive at a threshold, a threshold which is meaningful for all the users. Now, this threshold of this thousand dollars could be meaningful for various users out there. If thousand dollar is missing in a financial statement, maybe the users are will be like, okay, I cannot take a decision because something wrong. We should not miss this amount. So to ensure and to fulfill that, okay, you know what? We cannot test everything, but we have to test relatively larger portion of the transaction. He first starts with establishing a threshold, and that threshold is called as materiality. So materiality is a threshold that is established by the auditor. A misstatement about this materiality will affect the decision makers. Will affect the decision makers and it will affect the users. So just imagine you are an investor and you see a mistake of thousand dollars. It affects your it affects your decision making. You say, oh, thousand dollars is missing, something wrong. If you're an investor with million dollars, you'll be like, thousand dollars is not much. Right? So an auditor has to come up with the thinking of all the investors. He cannot say, okay, you know what? All the investors might be either million millionaires or might be earning only small amount. There could be various investors in a business. He might have to take think from all of these investors' perspective. So to come up with the threshold where he can investigate those transactions which are above this materiality to identify the potential misstatements he will come up with something called as benchmark. Because once you have a process of identification of this materiality, every investors will have a peaceful time. So if let's say, for example, we established a materiality called thousand dollars and we say that this is the way which we identified the materiality. We came up with a benchmark. If we say that, then if we are an, if there is an investor who is earning only $10,000, thousand dollars, materiality seem to be very high for him. He'll say, no, no, you should not investigate only transactions above thousand dollars. You have to investigate below them also. So you keep the materiality lower. But what will he tell him? No, there is a process involved. Now, when he looks at the process, he'll say, yeah, it makes sense. So if the process makes sense for the investor, he will agree to it. So he needs to take care or consideration of all the investors who have invested in the business. So he needs to have an appropriate judgment involved and a benchmark involved to establish the materiality of what are the transactions we are going to audit about this materiality and about this materiality, if there is mistakes, means the financial statements are not appropriate. That benchmark is this. 
you can go for profit before tax for the company you will establish materiality as 5 percentage if it is gross profit 0.5 to 1 percentage if it is revenue 0.5 to 1 percentage profit after tax 5 to 10 percentage total assets 1 to 2 percentage net assets 2 to 5 percentage okay so the auditor uses this benchmark and arrive at a figure which he says that about this any misstatement is uh, is uh, is a unmodified opinion sorry modified opinion and below this there is unmodified is that so what if there are five mistakes there are five mistakes okay five mistakes for dollar 800 the auditor will not investigate those transactions why because each transaction consisted of only dollar 800 now the materiality is thousand any transaction below this we will not investigate so thousand dollar is your materiality anything below we will not investigate so what if there are five mistakes comprising of 800 dollars what will you do what happens 5 into 8 is dollar 4000 now definitely it is above the materiality so what will you do what does the auditor do now if there is such kind of mistakes where the transactions are below the materiality but collectively the mistakes collectively are above materiality that's called as an aggregate aggregate materiality to identify such cases the auditor will establish the first level of materiality he will establish a second level of lower materiality lower materiality that is called as performance materiality the overall materiality the thousand dollars as i told you as a ballpark number okay this is for the entire financial statement which means if there is a mistake in revenue there is a mistake in expenses all of them added together will be checked against this thousand dollars in performance materiality, we will establish for each of the account a specific materiality. And the performance materiality are lower than the $1,000, maybe at 75%, $750. So we'll say a performance materiality of $750. Now what happens? Now, when we establish a performance materiality of $750, we would have investigated the transaction of $800. So we would not have missed it. That's the beauty of materiality. We'll step, we'll set aside levels of materiality. First level is overall materiality, which is for the entire financial statement. Wherever there is mistake, we will add together and compare against the overall materiality. Performance materiality is for each of the account so that we will be identifying for each account if there is a mistake, whether the mistake is material or not, and we will not miss any um, material transactions. It's called as performance materiality. Using performance materiality, we will select samples. Samples are selected using selected samples. Samples are selected using performance materiality. Samples are selected using performance materiality. And as I told you, the level one is overall materiality. Level two is performance materiality which is lower for each of the transaction we will keep something called as tolerable error the error which we can tolerate that is called as te that's a third ground of materiality it's the lowest level for each of the transactions let's say for example there is one invoice which we identified um, there is a revenue which we've got as per the invoice it is 100 but as per uh, the transaction, it is 500, so 400 difference. We cannot accept it. We'll say, no, this is not right. You have to rectify it. That is called as tolerable error. Error which we can tolerate, the auditor can tolerate, which is the lowest level of materiality. When we have these three levels of materiality, what happens? Even if we miss in the other case, like risk of giving an inappropriate opinion, we might miss certain transactions because we are doing a reasonable assurance. Even if we miss to do something or even if we miss to identify a misstatement, the misstatement will not be above the overall materiality. That's why we have various levels of materiality. Overall materiality, performance materiality, 
tolerable error. Alright? Don't worry if you have not got this. We will explain this again in detail during chapter number 6. But just understand the basics. There are three levels of materiality. Overall materiality, performance materiality and tolerable error. Overall materiality is for the entire financial statements. Performance materiality is targeted towards specific accounts where which will use it to select the samples. Tolerable error is for the transactions, individual transactions. Uh, if they are having a mistake, we will, uh, rect uh, we will ask the client to rectify because that's the rate of error which we can accept. That's the rate of error which we can accept. So next, uh, let us understand audit evidence. What is audit evidence? Audit evidence is the information that is uh, used by the auditor to arrive at his opinion. So as I said, the objective of the auditor is to give an opinion and his opinion is framed based on the evidence he collects. So he needs to establish, the auditor needs to establish a process where he designs and performs certain audit procedures to identify, uh, to collect, to collect uh, the audit evidences, sufficient and appropriate audit evidences. Audit evidences, uh, an auditor, in order to, uh, you know, auditor, uh, in order to form an opinion, the audit evidences have to be sufficient in nature as well as appropriate. Sufficient measures the quantity of the audit evidence, like how much evidence he has gathered. If the, uh, if the transaction he is trying to prove true and fair, if it is a risky transaction, then he has to collect more amount of evidence. Like more samples is required. More samples means more evidence, definitely. Second is appropriateness. Appropriate measures the quality of the evidence. If a evidence is of to have a good quality, it has to be relevant as well as it has to be reliable. Relevance means for what purpose he is collecting the evidence for. Like what, uh, what is the characteristics he is trying to prove in terms of a transaction. If he's trying to prove that the revenue has occurred, then he needs to have an invoice in nature. But whereas he's trying to prove we have received the cash based on the revenue, he should have a bank statement in nature. So the audit evidence he's trying to prove should be connected with the logical purpose of the procedure that he has performed. So he's trying to prove, you know what, whether we have received the money in relation to the revenue, he has to go and check the bank statement. He cannot go and check the invoice and say whether we have received the money or not. So the purpose and what kind of characteristic the transaction is we are trying to prove is what is required. We'll study this in later in chapter uh, 7 and 8 uh, in detail but yeah. The second one is reliability. Reliability is based on the source of the audit evidence. The source and the circumstance under which we have obtained it. Reliability is, uh, is depends completely upon from where we have got the evidence, like who has given us the evidence and um, how did we collect the evidence and from which source we have received the evidence. An audit evidence is reliable, firstly, based on this chart that I have given to you. An external evidence are more reliable than an internal evidence. An external evidence is coming from third party third party might not, uh, you know, lie. So an external evidence is more reliable than getting it from the client's internal records because internal records can be manipulated by the management. If the auditor himself is going and collecting the evidence or directly taking the evidence, then definitely um, it is more reliable. Entity driven evidence, if the entity himself is, uh, is, is obtaining the evidence, then it is reliable only when the control are operating efficiently. The control are operating effectively, then entity driven evidence is reliable. Of course, written evidences are more reliable than the oral representations because oral representations can be retracted or modified as per the convenience of the management. So written evidences are more important than oral. Original, we need original documents rather than photocopies because photocopies um, can be easily altered by the client. So definitely when you're collecting an evidence, it has to be from a reliable source and it has to the document themselves have to be a reliable document for us to prove a transaction. 
And when an auditor is trying to collect these evidences, he performs the so-called procedures that we have highlighted here. Auditor tries to collect the evidences in two nature. First, he tries to prove the control is working fine or working effectively. It's called as test of controls. He's collecting evidences about the operating effectiveness of the control because the control prevents and detects material misstatements. So if the control prevents and detects material misstatement and the control is working fine and if you're proving that the control is working fine, then the, there could be no material misstatements in the financial statement. Right. So in, let's say for example in a store there is CCTV camera and the CCTV camera is working fine or there is a burglary alarm and that is working fine and then there will be no um, criminals who will be trying to th uh, steal items from the store because if he tries to steal he will get captured in the camera and the alarm also will start ringing and hence we will be able to catch the thief. So similarly controls are established to ensure that firstly People who are trying to make a fraud or commit a fraud will be scared of it because he will get caught. Second, if even if without his, uh, you know, without showing lack uh, with, or without with having lack of knowledge, without having lack of knowledge, he goes and commits the crime, he will get detected. So, test of controls are established in such a way to prevent or detect or detect fraud or errors happening in a financial statement. And if we prove that the test of controls are effective and in turn we are proving that financial statements are free from material misstatement. The second way we are trying to identify or collect the procedure or collect the gather the evidence is through substantive procedure. <coughs> substantive procedures are the audit procedures that is performed directly on transactions on all the transactions and to collect necessary audit evidences. The auditor will perform this, these procedures to collect the evidences. In short form, they are A, E, I, O, U. A stands for analytical procedure. Analytical procedure means analysis. For example, ratio analysis. Comparisons. Comparing, uh, you know, the financial data com with the financial data themselves or comparing the financial and non-financial data. That's called as analytical procedures. When you perform analytical procedures, you will be able to get a preliminary identification whether the, there are any mistakes in the financial statements or not. Inquiry, you are talking to the client and understanding the process, how they have recorded the transaction, it is an evidence. Inspection, you are checking the books of accounts, you are checking the evidences themselves, you are checking the invoices, you are comparing against the, tra uh, against the transactions, is obtaining evidence themselves. Observation, you are checking how the accountant is you know, performing the journal entries, or posting the journal entries is a is a collection of evidence themselves. Recalculation: the client has calculated some depreciation, and we are trying to recalculate it. Is a is a you know is a way where auditor is reperforming and checking whether they are appropriate. That itself is called as uh, that itself is con considered as obtaining of evidence. So that's called as substantive procedures. The substantive procedures we will perform based on the summary A E I O U. Remember this mnemonic. It's very important for your uh, practical aspect where when you're writing it, you need to think of how you're going to perform each of the substantive procedure. Finally, once he has uh, performed all this procedure and obtained all the evidences, it's important for him to come to a conclusion. It's, and he'll come to a conclusion based on his opinion. The opinion of an auditor can be of two categories. One is a modified opinion. And second is unmodified opinion. Unmodified opinion is the best opinion that the client can get. is true and fair. Which means the financial statement gives true and fair view or it presents fairly means that the, the financial statement does not contain any errors. That is called as unmodified opinion. What about modified opinion? It does contain certain errors or it's not correct. It's not true and fair. Modified opinion can be of two categories due to lack of evidence, due to material mistake. Lack of evidence means the client is not giving us evidence or there is a transaction and we are unable to prove the transaction because we don't have any evidence. 
If we want to prove the transaction is true and fair, we need to have evidence. But if we don't have an evidence, then we cannot prove the transaction. And if there is a modified opinion and there is a lack of evidence, we will think of two categories. One is whether it is material but not pervasive. Second, material and pervasive. If it is material but not pervasive, we will issue qualified opinion where we will say except for this particular transaction or except for this particular account, everything remain, uh, is, oh, is true and fair. So we are calling out only for one transaction or one specific account and saying that no, this particular item is not um, appropriate except this item, all other are true and fair. For that, if there is lack of evidence, we will issue a qualified opinion where it is material but not pervasive. If it is material and pervasive, we will issue disclaimer of opinion. Disclaimer is close to saying that we have not given any kind of opinion at all. We are unable to express an opinion because everything is wrong. It's like I am not able to come to a conclusion. Not able to come to a conclusion because I cannot say whether it is right or wrong because I don't have any evidence. So the entire it is equal to saying the entire financial statement we have not audited at all. I have not formed any opinion at all. It's a very bad statement because we, they have not given us any evidence. And then the modified opinion can be given due to material misstatement. Material misstatement is where there is a transaction but the transaction is errorless in nature. Like it's not, it's not matching to the evidence that we have gathered. If the transaction or the account is material in nature but they are not pervasive, we will issue a qualified opinion. Again, except for that particular account, everything else is appropriate. Everything else is appropriate. If it is material as well as pervasive, we will issue adverse opinion. We will say clearly that the FS do not present fairly. It's equal to saying everything is wrong in this transaction. Everything is wrong. It's equal to saying everything is wrong in this particular transaction. Because FS does not present fairly. Why? Because there is material and pervasive issue. So you can say the common words between lack of evidence and material misstatement of modified opinion is material and pervasive. What does material mean? If there is a mistake or for a transaction we are unable to get an evidence, it is material if the transaction is above our materiality threshold. Then it's material. But what is pervasive? It's more than materiality. It's impacting a huge area of our profit or loss account. The transaction alone is 75 percentage of our gross profit. It's a pervasive issue. It's a bigger issue. It's a bigger issue. Or it, it, it affects, it affects multiple areas. It affects multiple areas of the, of the financial statement. It's a pervasive issue. Pervasiveness means it's a larger issue. It's a larger issue. Multiple accounts or multiple areas are wrong or there are some problems with multiple areas or multiple accounts, then it becomes a pervasive issue. It's a much larger issue. Material itself means something wrong, but pervasive means it's exorbitant. It's very large. It's quite huge. For the time being, you can just uh, understand this for the time being. So again, you can maybe pause the video and uh, you can maybe pause the video and note down uh, this transact uh, this particular process flow so that you can you know get an overview because uh, it's very important that you note this down because it's going to be tested in very recently in your chapters even from the first chapter we you need to understand these particular jargons and also as an you know as a triple a student you are expected to use the words qualified disclaimer rather than saying modified or unmodified opinion because modified and unmodified is a is a summarized way but qualified disclaimer opinion within modification is very precise and to the point so you need to know these topics as well so take a note down note of it uh, you can pause the video and take a note of it